Coral reefs are not doing very well today. There's a lot of threats that they are facing and all of them are due to human activities. There's been some estimates that we may lose many of our reef building corals and our reefs by 2050, so it's not very far in the future um, within my lifetime. Amid this devastation is a glimmer of hope. Hitting off the southern coast of Cuba lies one of the best preserved reefs on the planet. It might offer a key to saving reefs around the world. Jardines de la Reina is one of the few arrecifes pristinos that still remain in not many regions of the planet. So, to preserve it is a very good idea. My dream is always to go back in time. I always want to say, what was it like a hundred years ago? And here we can do that. A team of Cuban and American scientists will conduct the first ever top to bottom survey of this region with the goal of understanding the garden secrets. We're not just looking at the organisms you can see on the reef, the macrofauna, but we're also looking at the life that's unseen. The Gardens of the Queen offers sights and sounds found almost nowhere else, from the tiniest microorganisms to sharks and goliath groupers, and even a sonic environment that transmits messages to wildlife who rely on its reaches. We're seeing that even baby corals are responding to characteristics of the soundscape when they're looking for somewhere to attach on the reef. The hope is that after a month at sea, this team will have discovered some of the keys to coral reef survival into the 21st century. Si no sabes lo que tienes, no puedes protegerlo. This story starts the same way that almost all stories in Cuba do, with a revolution. As the world industrialized at breakneck speed, Cuba, for better or worse, developed at a slower pace. Economic isolation, smaller industry and fewer tourists mean that many of the country's natural treasures have remained intact. But the Gardens of the Queen is more than just a byproduct of the revolution. The Castro government made conservation a cornerstone of their policy. La sociedad de consumo destrozaron el medio ambiente, liquidaron millones de especies de plantas y animales, envenenaron los mares, exterminaron nuestros bosques y arruinaron los suyos. In 1996, the Cuban government created what would become the largest marine reserve in the entire Caribbean, the Gardens of the Queen. Two decades later, the reef is one of the best preserved on the planet. The 830 square mile marine reserve contains about three times more life than surrounding waters. And most importantly, the coral ecosystem appears more resilient to increasing pressures of climate change. Now, as the politics between America and Cuba are moving backwards, a joint Cuban-American team hope to conduct the most extensive expedition this region has ever seen. So when we get underwater at the gardens, which I can't wait, we'll see a seafloor that's covered with life. Basically, it looks like a busy little city. I often call the reefs the sort of analogous to Manhattan, where you have <laughs> a lot of different life going in and out and very, very busy. Dr. Amy April is the chief American scientist for this expedition. So one of the things that makes coral reefs so special is that they're able to harvest the sun's energy and use that to make carbon, to make life. So corals in particular harbor these symbiotic algae, these little tiny plants that live in their tissues and their job is to harvest the light and to help the coral convert that into sugars. Although they might look like colorful plants, corals are actually animals. They are made up of organisms called polyps, 
which have mouths and stinging tentacles. As corals expand and multiply, they provide a home for an astonishing amount of life. Over 25% of all marine species live on reefs. None of this will be possible without the symbiotic relationship between algae and polyps. And it's this critical connection that's under threat from climate change. The biggest threat globally to coral reefs is rising seawater temperature because seawater temperature of just half a degree warmer than normal for several weeks at a time will cause this disassociation between the corals, the animal, and their algae that live in their tissues. And this is called leaching because when the algae leaves, the coral essentially turns white and they generally can't survive after that point. More than 70% of reefs worldwide have already been exposed to dangerously high temperatures. But not all reefs are responding equally to the effects of climate change. And so that's something we're really looking for now on reefs worldwide. Which are the reefs that are able to withstand the pressures that they're facing in the ocean right now? Entonces este sistema tan extenso hace que sea muy resiliente. O sea, mientras más grande es un, es un sistema, sea un bosque, una pradera o un arrecife de coral, mientras más grande sea, más capacidad tiene de recuperarse de un impacto. The healthy mangrove and seagrass habitats in the gardens serve as spawning areas and protected nurseries that spur on booming fish populations. As the reserve becomes saturated with life, fish spill over into the surrounding waters, benefiting the region's fishermen. Jardines de la Reina es un ejemplo de muy buenas prácticas desde muchos puntos de vista. Y aquí una clave es una política, vamos a decir, nacional y un interés de las personas que están en ese sitio, que son las que están ahí protegiendo el área. It's this collaboration between scientists, policy makers and the local community that has made this a success story. And perhaps an example for other reef systems across the planet. Si es posible hacerlo en un país pobre, un país impactado, con muchas limitaciones, ¿por qué no sería posible lograrlo en Belice, en Islas Vírgenes, en Colombia? También pueden tener sitios de importancia mundial como los que tenemos nosotros. Los arrecifes de coral en el océano son un poco análogos quizás a los bosques húmedos y a las selvas tropicales en tierra. O sea, en el océano posiblemente sean los ecosistemas que mayor variedad de vida contienen. The diversity in the gardens is likely one of the important factors behind its resilience. A reef teeming with life is much more capable of surviving rising temperatures than a system that's already been weakened by pollution, overfishing and tourism. It's complex, it's intricate, it's fragile. And as you descend and you start to look at this overwhelming abundance of life and diversity, all I see is life stacked upon life stacked upon life. A week before the scientists began their expedition, Paul Nicklin and a team from Sea Legacy visited the gardens to showcase the beauty of this successful conservation project. Wherever I go in the world, it's, people always tell me stories of what it used to be like. And there used to be a lot of sharks. If you could have been here 20 years ago, you would have seen the big 300 pound groupers. You would have seen this reef before there was coral bleaching. And to go back 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years in time, and to be able to say this is what it looked like 1,000 years ago, that's pretty rare and that's pretty damn special. I did not expect to see on our first dive Caribbean reef sharks, silky sharks. Goliath groupers, tiger groupers. These are the big megafauna that says this is a healthy reef ecosystem. One of the most striking residents of the gardens is one you might not expect to find on a coral reef, the American crocodile. I'll get in the water with a grizzly bear, I'll get in the water with a leopard seal or a narwhal or whatever it is. I'll even get in the water with a polar bear. A crocodile, on the other hand, is something that I've always been nervous about. 
but the more time you spend with it, you realize that they, they live on this ecosystem. They live on the fish and the sardines and the animals and the species in this mangrove. It's just another species that's indicative of a healthy mangrove ecosystem. Another unique feature found in the gardens is one of the world's last healthy populations of Goliath groupers. La guasa es uno de los peces más grandes del mundo. Puede alcanzar más de dos metros y medio y pesar, hay reportes de hasta mil libras, 500 kilos. Es como un carro pequeño. Dr. Amargos is widely considered the leading expert in the gardens. He took part in the first surveys of the reef over two decades ago. Un lugar como este que es fuertemente protegido, todavía en 20 años no ha alcanzado los máximos niveles y tiene niveles dos veces y medio, tres veces superior a cualquier otro arrecife en Cuba y en el Caribe y comparable con los mejores arrecifes conservados del centro del Pacífico. Dr. Amargos now helps manage the tourism for the region, which is tightly restricted. Just a few thousand lucky divers are allowed to visit the reef every year. We've said it all along that if you protect it, it will thrive. And you say those words all the time, but everywhere you go, you never get to see it. But now here, we have stepped into a sample size of one of it is protected and it is near perfection. The gardens have remained a mystery for so long, partially because it's been so hard for scientists to access the area. No non-Cuban research vessel has ever been allowed into the gardens, but all of that changes with this expedition. The Alusia will serve as the hub for the greatest scientific exploration that the Jardines region has ever seen. Things so far are going well. We have about eight different kinds of science going on. I'm really excited though because everybody's coming together and working really well together. Dr. April and her graduate student are studying the microbes in and around corals and the chemicals that are in the surrounding water. So the chemistry and the microbes are a component of the life on the reef that we really haven't had a chance to characterize until the last few years. And so these are the, the hidden engines of the reef. The exchange of chemicals forms the basic currency for reef ecosystems. Nutritious chemicals are taken in and waste chemicals are pushed out. These are the cycles that allow coral systems to grow and facilitate the transfer of energy all the way up the food chain. So the chemistry, the molecules, they're fundamental features of every ecosystem on Earth, and including reefs, and our goal is to understand how they are doing that and how they help keep a, a reef, and especially a pristine Cuban reef, healthy. Other members of the expedition are surveying coral cover, analyzing the fish biomass in the region, or seeing how corals take in different chemicals. Most of these experiments have never been done here before, like the work that Dr. Lilis is doing with reef soundscapes. So most people have no concept of what it sounds like underwater, and that's something that's kind of exciting for me because I blow people's minds all the time <laughs> by telling them about how it's not this quiet, peaceful place necessarily that we think, and then there's also, like, Tons and tons of sounds underwater. So what we're listening to now is the coral reef chorus, I'll call it. Um, the main sound that you hear is this crackling uh, of the snapping shrimp. And then if you listen really closely, you can hear individual fish croaking sound, sometimes thumping, um, and that's their swim bladder reverberating. Dr. Lilis uses underwater recorders to help understand how reef sounds correlate with reef health. So fish uh, need to find a reef and they're in this vast ocean environment when they're first spawned they're moving through uh, the coastal area and they need to find a reef to settle down on and become adults 
And one of the things that first brought soundscapes to the forefront was evidence that these reef fish are using reef sound. We're seeing that even baby corals are responding to characteristics of the soundscape um, when they're looking for somewhere to attach on the reef. Victor and Freddy, a two-man team from the University of Havana, have been studying coral and fish health in the gardens for the past two years. Estamos en el trabajo casi más de 10 horas todos los días y compartimos muchos momentos, no solo en el trabajo de oficina, sino en el agua. Nuestra vida también depende del uno del otro y por eso eso también afianza más la relación de amistad. On this mission, they'll conduct visual surveys of life at the seafloor with the help of some GoPro cameras. In all, they plan on surveying close to 10 sites in this pristine reef. The work consists in identifying each colony up to the level of species and making a report of their health. If they have a blanket, if they have mortality, what kind of mortality, if it's recent or it's old, if they have some type of bioerosion, whether it's by polyketos or sponges. In fact, today I saw some colonies of Siderastrea and Siderea with manchas. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting because they have a different color of their skin. Some of them are in the same position, which is interesting will lead to a more comprehensive understanding of this system's health, providing a small piece in the puzzle of reef resilience. Well, I have a phrase that I like to use, and that is that the longest path always starts with giving the first step. It doesn't matter that we are doing this at a small scale, the important thing is that we are doing something. And that, in some way, this will be reflected in other places, and maybe serve as a link to other people to follow our steps. Con solo una persona que lo vea y sienta pasión por el mar, pienso que nuestra tarea está hecha y, y vamos a seguir haciéndolo hasta, bueno, hasta que el cuerpo nos dé. Out here on the water, the scientists are focused on their research, but the expedition has another goal that goes beyond science, showcasing U.S. Cuba scientific collaboration. Está ocurriendo esta expedición entre Cuba y Estados Unidos en un momento realmente muy difícil entre las relaciones entre los dos países. Entonces, tratar de mantener ese vínculo de unión haciendo cosas, a pesar de que es muy difícil, es muy importante. Less than a month before the expedition, President Trump ejected Cuban diplomats from the U.S. in retaliation for an alleged sonic attack on the American embassy in Havana. Effective immediately, I am canceling the last administration's completely one-sided deal with Cuba. In November, while the team was diving in the gardens, Trump reinstated many of the travel and trade restrictions that were removed under the Obama administration. We will enforce the ban on tourism. We will enforce the embargo. In light of the increasing political tensions, the international collaboration happening aboard the Alusia takes on even more importance. La ciencia ahora mismo está sirviendo de pretexto para unir a dos pueblos, ¿no? Es como que eh, americanos y cubanos trabajando de conjunto en arrecifes cubanos, pues eso salva cualquier otra diferencia. Entonces a veces no es solo científico, puede trascender la ciencia y en el futuro quizás hasta sea más importante el contenido político y el mensaje que se envía con esta diplomacia de agua salada puede ser más importante incluso que la propia actividad científica que hacemos nosotros. Despite the political situation, the scientists were able to continue their month-long expedition, collecting data that will serve to unlock the garden's mysteries. We've hit so many sites here in the Jardines region, so we have gotten a really good glimpse of the biodiversity that we can see on these reefs. And then for the microbes and the chemistry, we're taking samples home and we're going to be able to analyze those over the next few months to a year. 
I'm really excited to take those steps with the Cubans as well. We were already talking about a conference that's happening in Cuba next fall, and that will be a perfect time to bring our teams together again and hopefully present the story of what we've found here in the Hardinas region. The true wonder of the gardens is only understood in the context of the disaster that the planet is facing. If we don't halt climate change, more than 80% of reefs will suffer severe bleaching by 2040. By the end of the century, every single reef on the planet will be at risk. The scientists aboard the Alusia are doing their part, working hard to understand how to keep reefs safe in an uncertain future. But if climate change has its way, even the gardens with all their strength and resilience will fall apart. <laughs>